Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of in withdrawal now that the Olympics are over. It's something I've never grown out of. I've never become cynical about watching all those amazing athletes try and become the very best in the world at what they do. I'm enthralled and impressed with how talented they are and how much time and work they put into their events. And even though I am getting older, I still imagine what it would be like to be in the Olympics. Even at my advanced age, I would not have been the oldest athlete competing this year. Still, I have to admit that lack of youth is probably not the only thing holding me back from getting a gold medal. I'm a runner, and so I like to watch the track and field events and try to calculate how much better those runners are than I am. I say try, because it's basically impossible to compare, because they are that much better. It's very humbling. The other day I was running on the track, and that same night, was the one where Usain Bolt won one of his three gold medals. And it occurred to me that the time it took me to run once around the track as fast as I could, he could easily have run at least three and a half times around the track. It puts things in perspective, both my own limitations and how amazing an athlete like Bolt really is. The greatest in the world, even he calls himself that, and there's no argument from us because the whole world rejoices with him in it. Which puts our gospel story for today in a different perspective for me as well. Because at first, what Jesus has to say about not taking the seat of honor seems like pretty straightforward good advice. It's bad manners, not to mention potentially embarrassing to go into somewhere acting like you're a big deal, especially when the situation does not uphold it. Back to the Olympics again. It reminds me of that incident in the swimming competition with a Russian athlete who had previously been banned for doping. She won her qualifying heat and then victoriously wagged her finger above her head. I'm number one. Well, American Lily King, who had yet to swim the heat in the same event, took offense at this, both the gesture and the history of the Russian swimmer. And then King won the gold medal by half a second over that swimmer, Yulia Akimova and Akimova was publicly rebuked. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. But despite this example, I think sporting events are generally just one of the many places where we do exalt ourselves every day and cheer on others who do so. We live in a culture that invites us, even challenges us to find our inner awesomeness, to be the best that we can be, to grab the corner office or the best grade or the starring role in the play. How many of us have Facebook feeds that are full of friends mentioning that they came in last place? That they're doing a mediocre job at work and no one's really noticed anything special about them at all? Taking the lowest seat at the table is not really in our communal DNA. Certainly not in mine. And yet if we understand what Jesus is saying correctly, this is not a very Christian attitude. We probably shouldn't be doing any of this at all. No more my kids on the honor roll, or we're number one. If we want to be disciples, we need to brush up on our humility. And if we're planning a party in the near future, especially a wedding, we should not be inviting our friends and our loved ones, but the poorest of the poor. Now, I'm not saying these are bad things, or that they're not extremely holy. I'm not saying Jesus didn't say all of this, because we just read it from our Bible. Or that he didn't mean the things that he said because who am I to question what we hear? I'm just saying, these are hard things. Too hard for me, most of the time. I can muster a little humility if I really have to. And I hope I do my part in reaching out to those less fortunate. But I confess, I've never thrown a party for people who could never repay me. If this is discipleship, I'm a failure. The Usain Bolts of Christianity are lapping me on the track like I am standing still. And it gets worse, because a few verses from here in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says, Whoever comes to me and does not hate their father and mother, their wife and their children, their brothers and sisters, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. And if that were not even more impossibly challenging, a few verses after that, he says, 
None of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all of your possessions. Never mind me and my very imperfect example. I'm saying I've known a lot of really devout Christians in my life. Good people, holy people, faithful people, Olympic champions of discipleship. I've never in my life known any of those people to hate their families or even to give up all their possessions. Even the monks and nuns I know keep some mementos, sometimes expensive ones. What grace? What about this message, straight from Jesus, is inviting us into good news? Not guilt for not doing enough, not being enough, not taking, taking the lowest seat because we feel like that's where we belong, because we still own stuff and adore our children. This doesn't feel like the love of God to me. So I'm wondering, too, if this also might be all about perspective. I'm wondering if Jesus isn't pushing the idea of holiness and obedience to God to such an extreme for a reason. And I wonder if the reason isn't something like this. It doesn't matter how good we are. God loves us all the same. And no matter how good we are, no matter how good we could ever possibly be, God's love for us God's kingdom of love is so much larger even than that. So large, we can hardly conceive of it. The thing about religion, about being religious, is that it is, in some ways, like being athletic. If we want to get it, we have to practice it. So yes, we do pray, we do come to church, we read our Bibles, we take Sabbath rest, we love our neighbors, and we give to those in need. These are all very good things. But the end product of this is not that we become super disciples like super athletes do. Where the comparison fails is that discipleship is not about how awesome we are. It's about how awesome God is. It's how we come closer to understanding that God's love eclipses anything we can imagine. Even our sense of what is valuable. Even our love so I'm wondering if what Jesus is saying here is that we can push ourselves to the extreme. We can give everything away. We can turn our backs on who and what we love. We can live among the poorest of the poor. We can become super ultra disciples who know nothing but the sustaining power of God's love. But if we're doing this because we feel we need to earn God's love, we will never get there. We would have to do all of that a million times over to even get close. On the other hand, we're fully loved by God, even when we don't do anything to deserve it. Right after all these hard sayings in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus then launches into probably the most famous story in the Bible, the parable of the prodigal son. On the off chance you're not familiar with it, it goes something like this. A young man wishes his father dead, takes all his money and squanders it, and finally comes home because the good times are over and now he's sorry doesn't even wait for him to open his mouth to apologize. He runs to him in joy and throws him a feast. This puts a whole new spin on hating your family and giving away all your possessions in order to be a disciple, I'm thinking. But it also shows something else about what Jesus is saying about following him. We are not good in order to be loved. We are loved. And any goodness in us flows from knowing this, from believing no discipleship competitions. Thank God. If we think we can outdo each other in holiness or wholesomeness or humbleness, we're missing the point. And the good, good news, any scale we can possibly use to measure the love of God will be so indescribably tiny that it will be ridiculous. And so anywhere we find ourselves on the scales of life, rich or poor, accomplished or struggling, lonely, or surrounded by family and friends, it all pales in comparison to how much love God has for us, and how much love is revealed to us in following Jesus. It is especially good news for those who are poor, or struggling, or lonely. But it's still good news even when things are going our way. God's love is bigger even than this. There are more blessings in life even than this. There is life even beyond this. This is humbling in a good way, in a way that makes
makes us fall to our knees in gratitude and joy and worship a God that is that big. It's all about the perspective and the magnitude of believing in this kind of love, of being exalted. 